Today we're going to talk about the spiritual world in this presentation called The Haunted World. And we can begin to look at this question of uh, whether the spiritual world exists, even, by asking ourselves in Western society, and probably in most of the world, really, but um, let's just confine ourselves to Western society, what are the most important things in life? And I think most of us would not be saying, you know, it's uh, having a new car or, or, or a big house or material things, but we would say that there are things like love and honor, friendship, family, significance, identity, acceptance, praise, and, you know, and so forth. And we would have to say that these things are really non-material. But we also have to ask, do they have any real meaning? Do they, you know, these things like love and uh, acceptance and honor, do they really mean something? Do they, are they really significant? Or are they just uh, tricks our, um, our brains are playing on us? Darwinism says there's some kind of survival value and really have no meaning at all apart from that. They're just chemicals, <laughs> chemicals bouncing around in our brains. And this is um, kind of what Nature magazine is saying, with all deference to the sensibilities of religious people, the idea that man was created in the image of God can surely be put aside. And understanding that the image of God includes all those non-material qualities or aspects of our being. On the other hand, we have physicists who are saying that quantum mechanics is telling us something else. And Eugene Wigner, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, says, while a number of philosophical ideas may be logically consistent with present quantum mechanics, materialism is not. So the most proven scientific theory ever is telling us that materialism is not consistent with what science understands. Now, what does that mean? Of course, probably most scientists, or many scientists at least, are, you know, don't believe that. Let's look at the problem, which may not be stated out loud by many scientists, but here it is. Uh, Jerome Elbert uh, says, if souls exist and are essential for thinking and decision-making, our mental processes involve frequent communications from the brain to the soul and from the soul to the brain. And he says, I find the idea of such interactions very disturbing. It would mean the human brain is an interface to another non-physical world. So if the soul is a non-physical thing, this means that you know our, our, our brains are somehow interacting with this non-physical world. He goes on to say, such interactions suggest that the rules of science apply to all of the universe, except for human beings. This picture gives humans a unique position in the universe. This anthropocentric picture seems very unacceptable to the scientific worldview. But is it true? And, you know, again, this stuff about um, the scientific worldview uh, saying that, you know, the human center of the universe is uh, obviously wrong. Uh, you know, there's an interesting belief, but, you know, I'm not sure it's true. Uh, maybe we'll explore that a little bit more. Let's look at the universe. Now, according to current speculation, scientific speculation, the universe is 70% dark energy and 25% dark matter. And in the end, only 5% is uh, regular stuff. <laughs> okay, so... Um, you know, if, if there's all this stuff we, we can't see, maybe there is stuff we don't know about. Okay, well, um, if we take a look at what the Bible says, there's some, a couple of interesting verses. And one is, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, in Proverbs 1.7. And another interesting one is that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth, John 4.24. And in Romans 1, 19 to 20, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes... Namely, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. Now, what is it that God has shown us? Going back to early human history, there are certainly clues, what we can call on the, um, the crude level of looking at creation, which are things like uh, just the, the, the design of life, you know, of, of our world, of, um, things like you know, butterflies and flowers and so on. Or, or looking at how, for example, the solar eclipses, where the sun is just perfectly covered by the disk of the moon. And that takes a very specific finagling with, with the universe, you know, for that to happen. Um, but here, we, we, we're going to take a look at a very subtle uh, aspect of uh, a, a, what advanced uh, scientific discovery is saying. What is God showing us? So all throughout history, there are clues. But uh, in this day and age, there are even bigger clues. that something funny is going on behind the physical material world. And in their book, The Quantum Enigma, uh, Rosenblum and Kuttner put it this way, we physicists tend to keep our skeleton in the closet, and some even deny its existence. Interesting. What are they talking about? Well, let's, uh, you know, recall, if you will, Newtonian physics, which served us for hundreds of years uh, in terms of being able to understand and predict how the world behaves. And of course, if we ask ourselves 
um, in that framework, if a tree falls in the forest and you know, and no one's around, doesn't make a sound, we would say, of course, you know, sound waves are emitted; they're created and emitted. Um, and reality, we could see it as kind of a machine. Everything is objective. We can, you know, it's there no matter whether you see it or not. If you were there, uh, if you ran experiments, uh, you would experience, you know, these aspects of reality. You could touch things. So reality was mechanistic, it was reductionistic. You could reduce things to forces, you know, and calculate them and predict what's going to happen. And um, things were connected through physically real forces, right? So uh, magnetism, electromagnetism, gravity, that's, that's what connects everything. And for some people, this led to a deterministic ways of looking at consciousness, a free will, and history, right? So Marxism uh, thought or claimed to be a scientific uh, understanding of, of history. You know, people are just machines, and uh, human beings are just, their minds are just uh, mechanistic, and eventually things would work out in a particular way. Uh, same with consciousness, free will, you know, it's just chemicals in your brain, uh, result of evolution. Uh, you're just, you know, you're not, not much more than these uh, atoms behaving like billiard balls bouncing around in your brain. But then we come to the quantum world. And here we can see that, um, you know, we have, we're able to manipulate matter to the extent of um, individual atoms, you know, or uh, placing them... Uh, at the, uh, on the atomic level, any patterns that we want, right? But what is an electron? What is an atom? What are they? The strange answer is that nobody really knows. Okay, nobody really knows what an electron is. We have models of them. Uh, we have uh, equations that predict their behavior, explain that you know how they move. But nobody really knows what they are. We have equations about something, but what is that something? Nobody knows. And quantum theory implies that at least some atoms are, are tied with our consciousness. Now, before you, um, you know, scoff at this, keep in mind that quantum theory is the most tested and verified theory in all of science. There's no dispute about what the experiments show. Right? So the problem is in how we understand the results of these experiments, how do we explain these experiments, how do we interpret these, these results. So it is the interpretation and trying to explain the results that we are seeing that raises the problem, or might I say the specter, the ghost in a machine. So what is the deeper meaning of all this? And for this, we go to an explanation or a story presented in the book, The Quantum Enigma, which tries to illustrate this, and it's uh, really very interesting. So in the book, the illustration they use is um, of a scientist, just a hard-nosed, you know, objective type, invited to observe uh, some mysterious phenomena in this other country, <clears throat> some mysterious land, you know, kind of like a Shangri-La. Um, so he goes to this country, he travels there, and um, he meets the, you might call him a, the wise man or the shaman, whatever you might call him. So first the wise man uh, shows him this couple, and you can see these two huts, uh, which are placed some distance apart. Now, here they're closer together, this live show, but for the experiment, they're, you know, maybe, let's say, uh, 500 yards apart, some big distance. To start the experiment, the visitor is asked to wear, the, wear a hood, and this is called preparing the state. After the hood is removed, the wise man says, okay, well, you see these two huts? The couple is in one of these huts. What question would you ask to find out which hut they're in? To which the scientist says, okay, in which hut is the couple? And the door is opened, and um, the scientist sees they're in one of the huts, in this case, the left-hand side. And the wise man says, aha, look, you made them appear in one of the huts by asking that question. To which the scientist, of course, says, what? What are you talking about? I said, okay. The wise man says, okay, let's try it again. Put on the hood and take off the hood. Now ask the question again. Uh, okay, in which hut is the couple? And again, the doors are open and you see that the couple is in one of the huts. And the wise man again says, aha, look, you made them appear in one of the huts, one of the two huts by asking that question. And the scientist is kind of getting a little tired of this. And the wise man says, okay, let's, okay, try it again. Okay, put on the hood, take off the hood. In which hut is the couple? Asked the scientist. And again, the doors are open and the couple is shown in, this time in a different hut. And the wise man says, oh, look, it worked again. You made them appear in one of the two huts by asking the question. And the scientist is really getting tired and is ready to go. Uh, <laughs> you're wasting my time. <clears throat> At the wise man's insistence, he tries it again. And again. At this point, the wise man says, all right, um, I understand you're getting fed up with this. But you really need to stay and really need to try something else. This time, ask a different question. In which hut is the boy? And in which hut is the girl? Now, the scientist is totally fed up, but okay, he goes along with it, and he asks the question. The doors are open, and now they're in two separate huts. And the wise man says, look, you made them appear in different huts by asking that different question. 
to which the scientist is, of course, puzzled. And he's asked to try again, which he does, puts on the hood, takes it off, and asks the question, in which hut is the boy, in which hut is the girl? Again, the doors are open, and they're in different huts. And again, the wise man insists, you made them appear in different huts by asking that question. And you try it again, and again, and they might, they might be in different huts, they, uh, they might switch huts, but um, they're always in uh, one hut each. And now the scientist is getting totally fed up, but the wise man persuades him to hang on a bit, and now he gets to choose which question. So after removing the hood, uh, putting on the hood and removing it, he gets to choose which question to ask. And he asks, in which hut is the boy and in which hut is the girl? And it happens as you might expect by now. And he asks the same question and gets the same result in the sense that they're each in separate huts. But now he decides to switch things up and asks a different question. In which hut is the couple? And sure enough, when the doors are opened, it is the couple that is in one of the huts. And he tries it again. In which hut is the couple? Again, they are both in one of the huts. And he decides to change things up again and ask a different question. In which hut is the boy and which is the girl? And they're in separate huts. And he goes on doing this um, forever. <laughs> And depending on which question he asks, the results change. And it's almost as if, as the wise man says, the question causes the outcome to be of a different type. Now, here's the thing. Reality is like this. Physical experiments show us that the world is inexplicable at its core, right? At its very foundations. And we see evidence, uh, experiments show us that ex events are happening without a material cause without a physical cause. And there are a phenomena called entanglement, uh, spooky action at a distance. Uh, there was Einstein who called it spooky. Uh, something that happens over here affects something that happens way, way, way over there without any physical connection. And in relation to the story we just looked at, light behaves as either a wave or a particle, depending on which experiment or depending on which question you choose. And I hear of a, a very interesting video by uh, about a Dr. Quantum, uh, which you can find on YouTube, by which explains the experiment in a, a really great clarity. So let's take a look at that. And here we are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles or little balls of matter act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, Let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter, through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought. Maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So, they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they can interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one, and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back 
to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of any. The very act of measuring, or observing, which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. So here we're faced with the quantum enigma. To produce the interference pattern that we see here, each atom must have been a spread out thing, a wave that came through both slits. On the other hand, we can always make it behave like a particle if we observe which slit it comes through. So on the left here, we see it behaving normally unobserved, right? behaving like a wave, interfering and getting the interference pattern. On the right, as soon as we put detectors by the slits, this all goes away and the electrons behave like particles again. Uh, here we have a, a more humorous presentation. And while you're not observing on the top, it's waves. And once you start observing, paying attention, it's particles. Experiments share the same behavior for electrons, atoms, molecules, uh, and even larger uh, assemblages of atoms. And all physical objects can be described by a wave function, which is the probability of finding that object in a particular place. And take note that it doesn't mean that's the probability that the object is actually there. It's the probability of finding the object there if you look for it, if you ask a particular question, to put it another way, if you do a particular experiment. Right? You choose how to find it, you choose how to look for it, and that's your probability. Of course, this defies a common sense view of physical reality. Now, as it happens, there is a, a version of the experiments which you might probably have thought of to do, and physicists have actually thought of it before you. <laughs> so it is called the delayed choice experiment. Of course, it goes something like this. You've said to yourself, okay, I know how this experiment is supposed to go. Uh, if I ask this question, I'll get this kind of an answer. What if I switch it up a little? And the source of this uh, thought experiment is actually from the, the symbiotic universe uh, by uh, Greenstein. So what if you put the film where you're gonna register the hits and the source and the slits far, far away, uh, you know, way across the, the galaxy. So far that it'll take one year for the electron to get from the slits to the film. And you put the film at a minima, which is at a place where it will never be exposed if it travels as a wave. So it's one of these dark bars uh, and that's where you put the film, so it'll, it'll never hit there. Now, you start the experiment, you fire the, whatever, let's say photons, well, let's say electrons. So uh, the electron, uh, since you're using a film, and you're not observing which slit it comes through, it goes through the slits, and obviously goes through as a wave, because that's what it always does when you don't observe which slit it goes through. So we wait. We wait a year. And the electron, the, the photon, the electron's been, been traveling and traveling, Pass way past the slits for a month, January, February, March, April. It, it travels to our galaxy, you know, uh, the outer planets, the middle planets, you know, past Saturn. And it's been traveling and traveling and traveling. And it's going to reach Earth. And just at the last moment, you jump in and you change the detection method. You put in these two detectors pointed at the slits that will register which slit it came through. At the last moment, you jump in and you change it instead of using a photofilm. And uh, in this case, uh, using cloud chambers, which will show a track uh, when the electron, if an electron passes through it. And so, at the last moment, you leave forward, snatch away the film, and replace it with two cloud chambers, and a track immediately appears in one of the cloud chambers, one of the detectors. And so, by your action, you have altered the past one year of history. So this, again, brings up the question of how reality is tied up with observers. And another experiment which demonstrates this is the Zeno effect. Uh, named after Zeno's paradox about the person shooting the arrow and asking how the arrow could ever arrive at the end since it keeps traversing half distances and never reaching it. Oh, that was, <laughs> I'll get into that. If you observe an atom, you can prevent it from decaying. So if you have what's called an unstable quantum system with two states, state A, the undecayed state, and state B, the decayed state, and if you keep making observations right after short periods of time, the probability that the system will be in state A during each measurement is dramatically higher than the probability that the system will be in state B. So in other words, the system keeps collapsing back into the undecayed state A and never has time to devolve into the decayed state. It's kind of like uh, they say a, uh, a washed pot never boils. You can actually prevent the atom from decaying by observing it repeatedly at the right time. This is not theoretical. And what I you know, described, again, the previous experiment about uh, from a year, uh, it has been done on a smaller scale and observed at that scale. So we're seeing here in these observations 
in these experimental results that physics is somehow entangled with consciousness. And that is the bugbear, the skeleton in the closet of uh, quantum physics. Our free will and choice somehow affects the physical world. Now, if our free will and choice can affect the physical world, can they affect the spiritual world, if that exists? And all these observations suggest action in another dimension, because they are effects that occur without any physical cause. At least, no physical cause in this universe. So Einstein called this spooky action at a distance, which are effects without any material causes in this universe. Now, what can produce non-material causes? Well, the Bible tells us that God is spirit. Now, what does this mean? Now, Wayne Grudem describes it this way. God's spirituality means that God exists as a being that is not made of any matter, has no parts or dimensions, is unable to be perceived by our bodily senses, and is more excellent than any other kind of existence. Eugene Wigner, Nobel Prize winning physicist, tells us that while a number of philosophical ideas may be logically consistent with present quantum mechanics, materialism is not. So if you're a materialist and you're claiming to follow the science, follow where the science leads, you have to reject your materialism because quantum physics is telling us that the universe, material and matter, is somehow entangled with non-material causes and mind. Of course, Einstein found this uh, as disturbing as we do. And he said, I like to think the moon is there even if I'm not looking at it. Very understandable. It is basic for physics that one assumes the real world existing independently from any act of perception. But this we do not know. Very odd. Sir Rudolf Peierls, Manhattan Project physicist, put it this way. The quantum mechanical description is in terms of knowledge. And knowledge requires somebody who knows. Somehow the universe's existence depends on consciousness and knowledge. What does that mean? <laughs> well, who knows and observes the entire universe? Hmm. So we see here that the hierarchy of scientific explanation has to be revisited. And at the top we see what used to be, and for most people who are unaware of the implications of quantum physics, perhaps they still have this concept. Uh, at the bottom, uh, empirical facts. We know how the universe works. We understand how the universe works. It's all matter, billiard balls uh, on a really small scale. And then upon that is built physics, chemistry, biology, and then psychology. But quantum physics experimentally shows us instead of ex uh, empirical facts, we have at the bottom consciousness. Of course, some wise guy put it this way, <clears throat> uh, I think in protest of this idea, there was a young man who said, God must find it exceedingly odd to think that the tree should continue to be when there's no one about in the quad. To which someone replied, Dear sir, your astonishment's odd. I am always about in the quad, and that's why the tree will continue to be, since observed by yours faithfully, God. And now we can have a different spin on this phrase from Proverbs 1 verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You might have asked, what, well, what does that mean before? But now it is a deeper meaning. Because to know, to know what we can about the, the world, the real world, uh, reality, uh, we're going back to something which the Gospel of John calls the Logos, which is Greek for the Word. And he put it this way, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1, 1 to 3. So the writer of John's Gospel took this Greek term, this idea logos, of the organizing principle behind the, the universe, and he said, well, th this is him. It's Jesus Christ who I've met. Now note that the physical world, according to the biblical view, is important. When God created it, he said it was good. It was very good. So the physical world, the material world, is not dirty or, you know, uh, unholy in itself. It's something that God created, and the Bible tells us that one day it will be restored to his uh, perfect state. So let's move on to consciousness. Will a computer ever be conscious, or can it ever be conscious? Now forget all the, the movies you've seen. Think about what a computer is. It's just something that carries out instructions that you give it to the letter every time. You can put in some randomization, you can add some something that you yourself can't predict, but that's in the code. And if a computer can't be conscious, humans are special in some way. And in, in a way that we think of as the soul. So what is consciousness? And uh, in the, their book, The Quantum Enigma, the authors put it this way, while atomic theory might explain the wetness of water, that's a far cry from explaining your feeling of its wetness. Our feelings and thoughts are experienced as possessions, somehow distinct from the self, while the self is experienced directly. Materialists are fond of saying, well, it's not a big deal, you know. Human minds are just a product of evolution. You know, it's a fact. And uh, in nature, no less, it's called an unassailable fact. Now, it, it, that's a totally unscientific claim as it's never been demonstrated that consciousness could arise from non-living material uh, in any sort of random, undirected fashion. And we see that this view does not fit in with quantum physics. It is non-scientific. <laughs> so, materialism also means there's no morality, no truth, right? And when you say no truth, that really means no science either. Because Darwinism, evolution, says our brains are shaped for fitness, for survival, 
not for truth. On June 3rd, we uh, came across a study that contradicts an earlier claim about something called the readiness potential. And it uh, was a, um, a study that was previously claimed to show that chemical processes uh, in the brain started to happen before you made a choice. And that shows that your choice is just, it's really not your choice at all. It's uh, just the results of chemical reactions. Because the average readiness potential reliably precedes voluntary movement, people assumed that it reflected a process specifically directed at producing that movement. And, and uh, as Aaron Schurger, assistant professor of psychology at Chapman University, a co-wrote the article, he says, as it turns out, and as a model has shown, that is not necessarily the case. So it looks like the readiness potential, the pre-movement buildup of activity, reflects the neural activity that underlies the formation of a decision to move, rather than the outcome of a decision to move. Your brain, 100 billion neurons. One neuron with 100,000 molecules, 80% water, and 10,000 connections. Each molecule is replaced 10,000 times, yet we maintain a sense of, sense of self. What holds this pattern? Our experience of ourselves is the clearest, most fundamental knowledge we can have. And as a physicist Nick Herbert put it, science's biggest mystery is the nature of consciousness. It is not that we possess bad or imperfect theories of human awareness. We simply have no such theories at all. Philosopher of mine B. Allen Wallace puts it this way, strictly speaking, at present, there is no scientific evidence even for the existence of consciousness. You can't even prove it scientifically. Rutgers University philosopher Jerry Fodor says nobody has the slightest idea how anything material could be conscious. Nobody even knows what it would be like to have, to have the slightest idea about how anything material could be conscious. So there's some, uh, it goes even deeper than you might think. All this is to imply that man is a spiritual being. And uh, some envision this as a trichotomy or a dichotomy, spirit, soul, body, and maybe the spirit and the soul are the same thing. Uh, scripture uses soul and spirit interchangeably. And the phrase spiritually dead does not mean our spirits are dead, but rather refers to our being out of fellowship with God due to sin, due to our disobedience. So man was created to be a unity of body and soul, according to the Bible. However, our soul can function consciously apart from our body, uh, as seen from these various scriptures, uh, Luke 23, 43, Acts 7, 59, 2 Corinthians 5, 8. Everyone will be resurrected. John 5, 28, 29 says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So we come back to the question, of what are the most important things? And I think uh, most of us will agree that the most important things are personal. They are relational, right? having to do with uh, people, our relationships with people and how we treat each other. Uh, and another way of thinking about this is morality. But relational can also cover other things like love and loyalty and friendship and so forth. But how important are these things really? How seriously should our choices be weighed? What should be the consequences of poor choices, of bad choices, of immoral choices? And that's uh, a bigger topic, <clears throat> of course. So some other notes on consciousness. Uh, mental events arise from the brain, but they can also make things happen in the brain. And so we see we're able to control our fears. Uh, we are able to also uh, control depression to some degree. Our mental states, our mental events can change the physical brain. We have the phenomenon uh, of placebos, of people recovering when they've only received a placebo. Uh, so we can see some, some of the evidences of the power of the mind. So there is, no sim for there is simply no direct evidence that anything material is capable of generating consciousness just not there. Regardless of our knowledge of the structure of the brain, no one has any idea how the brain could possibly generate conscious experience. As Nobel neuro neurophysiologist Roger Sperry wrote, those sentimose processes of the brain with which consciousness is presumably associated are simply not understood. They are so far beyond our comprehension at present that no one I know of has been able even to imagine their nature. Can't even imagine. No, uh, from one physicist, uh, physicist Nobel Prize winner, Eugene Wigner says, we have at present not even the vaguest idea how to connect the physiochemical processes with the state of mind. Okay? So this is, this is beyond pop science and pop psychology and all the pop stuff you hear all the time. Uh, this is what physics tells us. Author Larry Dossi, uh, also a physician, no experiment has ever demonstrated the genesis of consciousness from matter. One might as well believe that rabbits emerge from magicians' hats. Yet this vaporous possibility, this neuromythology, has enchanted generations of gullible scientists, in spite of the fact that, that there's not a shred of direct evidence to support it. Right? So that belief would not be very scientific. The sort of materialism uh, Worley espouses is known as promissory materialism, with its promise that someday we will be able to explain the mind in terms of the brain. The problem here, of course, is that someday never comes. Nobel laureate and neuroscientist John Eccles and philosopher of mind Daniel Robinson say the following. We regard promissory materialism as superstition without a rational foundation. The more we discover about the brain, the more clearly do we distinguish between the brain events and the mental phenomena. And the more wonderful do both the brain events and mental phenomena become. 
Promissory materialism is simply a religious belief held by dogmatic materialists who often confuse their religion with their science. And so we see here that promissory materialism, which cannot explain, no hope of explaining the mind, no hope of explaining consciousness, really is a religion. If you're going to choose a religion, perhaps consider the religion that begins with a great mind, the Logos, the organizing principle, the personal God of the Bible. The Logos, the word who visited 2,000 years ago. If you found this helpful, uh, please subscribe. I will find it encouraging and I might produce even more.